Crystal Tire Information Whiskey, 21530. Wind, 060 at 5. 06, Mike Juliet, this is Arch Radar Contact. SRS Weather Information from Minnesota, available on flight service frequency. You've dialed in the Flying Midwest Podcast. Connecting aviators from across America's heartland. Sharing news, information, and events from around the region. Sit back, relax, and join our crew for some hangar talk as we discuss a wide variety of regional aviation topics. And now, from our home at the Anoka County Blaine Airport, our checklist is complete and we're ready for departure for another episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another very special episode of the Flying Midwest Podcast. We're recording live at EAA 2024 just outside the AOPA tent, and uh, we're not actually sponsored by AOPA. We're just sort of commandeered some chairs, uh, but we're joined by two guests who actually got into the AOPA tent and are <laughs> much more accomplished than our, we are with their podcast. Uh, we are pleased to welcome to our, our podcast from the Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk podcast, AG and RH. Welcome, guys. Thank hello, you. hello. Thanks for having us. Welcome, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, we're going to start our podcast the same way we do with everyone, and we're going to do what we call our Fast Five questions. So it's a series of five quick response-ish questions. Okay. Um, they're mostly air venture based so let's see how this goes. Uh, question number one. Favorite plane you've seen at AirVenture, and it doesn't have to just be this year? P-47. Okay. Yep. That's about one of my favorite planes just ever anyway, so. The UPS 747. Oh. Yeah, that was uh, last year, right? Maybe two uh, years ago. Yeah, yeah, maybe two years ago. Maybe here two. last year. Yeah. Okay. And they did a rock your wings on the way out. It was pretty cool. Very All right, cool. that's yeah. cool. <laughs> 747 rocking their wings. That yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Question number two for you: Best kept secret of Air Venture. Oh, uh, the water cooler inside this <laughs> back door <laughs> at LPA. <laughs> uh, f- uh, for us, really though, um, I don't know. Best kept secret. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. That is a tough one. All the food's really good. That's really not a secret. This might this, be more than you wanted. Oh, I mean, this is actually pretty one. good right here. Yeah. This shade. Yeah, this is like, a good spot. The whole AOPA spot here is is actually really good. I like. Yeah, it. there's a lot of good hangouts, like places you can just wait for the next thing you're going to. You don't have to be roaming around outside. And I think the people who may come here once, or they think you got to be walking around, and it's, oh, you can go hang out somewhere and just chill out. Be in the shade. Yeah, be yeah. in the shade. Yeah, we actually plan to have all of our interviews right in this spot today, so. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Yep. AOPA doesn't know that. So, um, anyway, question number three. <laughs> Worst weather experience at AirVenture? Worst weather? Weather. Oh. We came after the weather in 19, the, the first, flood. Yeah. We came after that, right? Yes. So, we didn't, we but weren't. it was a, still, like. Swampy. Swamp. Wet everywhere. So 19 is the one I remember. Yeah, that was okay. a, that was a bad one. Last year, last year we got caught in a downpour out on the flight. Oh we were yeah, way yeah, out yeah. on the flight line. Ooh, nowhere to go. We just we're under a wing of an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Typically the weather's pretty quick here, which is good. In and out. In honor of Maddie, there goes the great deceiver. It always sounds like something cool, but it's just the tri motor. Uh, <laughs> question number four. We should clarify it. The tri motor is very cool. I mean, it is. You see it a hundred times seen, a yeah, day. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if you guys have heard that from our co host, Maddie, but she calls it the great deceiver. So, it gets us every time, like, oh, something cool. Not tri motor again. Uh, <laughs> question number four uh, Favorite food or beverage on the grounds? Mm, oh, gosh. I, I mean, love the cheese curds. Yeah, there. that's like a local thing, right? I mean, yeah. you got to have cheese curds. Um, but I'm a, I'm a sucker for a good bratwurst too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had those last. And you year. guys do those proper and yeah, yeah, you guys are in Wisconsin, Wisconsin, so they got yeah, they're kind of known for that. Yeah. Um, just as an aside, um, your live show director also has the title with our podcast of the cheese curd taco czar. Oh. So oh, 
if you need some cheese curd tacos, he knows where to go. Nice. <laughs> All right. Our final question of the Fast Five. If you could meet anyone in aviation, dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, man. Barry Schiff. Is that how you say his last name? Wrote a bunch of aviation books. Flew the airlines. His son is still doing active instructing out in California. Okay. Um, he is someone I read throughout my beginnings of general aviation. But I would love to meet him and pick his ear. He's flown hundreds of different types of airplanes, and he, he has probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. I That's a tough one. I think um, there's an Army helicopter pilot named Mike Novosel, for which they renamed Fort Rucker after him is now Fort Novosel. But um, he was a Vietnam guy, was like a hero you know, pilot in uh, Vietnam and is like a, f- his mural is painted on every wall in any a- army aviation. He's just an army hero. So that would be really cool to meet him. Uh, Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you gentlemen for playing along with our fast five questions. First of all, thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to sit down and chat with us about uh, your podcast and your backgrounds a little bit. Uh, we really appreciate having you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. So, um, Chat with us a little bit about your personal and your professional backgrounds. Um, so professional, you know, the I guess sort of like the foundation for why we do the show is flying experience and controlling experience. Um, currently an active controller in the FAA. I mean, I worked yesterday. I worked a sh- six to two yesterday before we got, got on a plane. Um, I'm, not, I'm not currently flying, but I've, I've got about... A little over 2,000 hours of flying okay. uh, for the Army. Most of that is in helicopters. Uh, about 200 and some of it is in a King Air, 200s, and commercial instrument rating. So, you know, that's professional side. Um, personal side, I grew up in the country, in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> in Washington State, in the desert. No one thinks of Washington State. I was just going to say, I don't think desert when I think Washington. Yeah, well, most, like, the entire Tent's eastern half, probably there. more of Washington <laughs> is dry <laughs> and deserty than it is green. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, grew up on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. Um, was outdoors all the time. That's all I did. And so, I still like to do a lot of that kind of stuff. I'm a Toyota fanboy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I have an 85 Forerunner that I tinker with. I have a newer Tacoma uh, that I daily drive, and uh, and my wife drives a Toyota minivan, so we're like a whole fleet of Toyotas in the house. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's so. Maybe a little known fact: we both grew up on the on the west side of the country. I moved from California to the East Coast when I was 12, and I've always been into aviation. I've always loved it. I think I always thought all those big jobs in ATC or as a pilot you had to be in the military i tried to go right. down that route in college um that did not work out so i thought my dreams of, of doing it professionally were done because of that but um i started taking lessons in a cherokee in new jersey about 25 years ago almost now uh so uh, personal life a little bit about me now i live in north carolina i'm married uh, i have a 13 year old son uh, navigating that with a, a different new job has been a challenge. We're working through that week by week. Yeah, now I'm, I'm back in the airline side of things after being a controller for quite a bit and loving it. Absolutely loving it. So, awesome. I guess I should have mentioned that I am married and have <laughs> <laughs> a 14 and a 12 year old okay. daughter, uh, two daughters. And. <laughs> yeah, I totally forgot yeah. them. Yeah, um, we couldn't get them to listen to our podcast, yeah. <laughs> let alone somebody else's about us. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's keep diving down the uh, aviation and flying experience road a little bit. And uh, AG, for you specifically, I've heard that airplane pilots make terrible rotor wing pilots, but helicopter pilots make half decent airplane pilots. Uh, what's what's <laughs> I, your take on? I have heard that as well. Um, 
the transition into the airplane was super easy. I mean, uh, well... That's because the wing isn't spinning, and it's infinitely easier to fly than a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It wants to fly. Um, the Chinook, though, is very forgiving. When, okay. when the systems on a Chinook are functioning the way that they should, it is super easy. It's very, very stable. Now you turn the flight computer off, and you you got your hands full because it doesn't know which rotor head is supposed to go forward or backwards or sideways. It will turn itself sideways and just go like two props into the air just as much as it wants to do anything so um without the flight computer on it is it's a bear but with it on it is super easy to fly the chinook is probably the easiest especially the f model chinook i mean you're it's a four axis autopilot you know down and, and it'll do an approach down to 40 feet and come to a hover so okay it's like your get out of jail free card. You just, you know, you hit the go around, hit the autopilot, put an approach in, and we wow. we called it the F model uh, warm fuzzy blanket because that would just get you out of trouble basically <laughs> anywhere. Um, so, anyway, to answer your question, a helicopter is inherently unstable. It requires a ton of control inputs. They're very very tiny, you know, very sensitive inputs. And the airplane just isn't quite that way, you know. It, um, it like I said, it wants to fly. So, yeah, I think there's, I think that's probably right. Um, you, when you get in an airplane, you're flying it like within like a couple minutes, right? Right. It took me a, a week to learn how to hover. That just, it doesn't come naturally. It's not sure. a, an intuitive kind of thing. It's super. It feels unnatural. So. I've been on the kind of a different angle from that. I've flown with guys that I could tell almost immediately that they previously flew helicopters. Their sense of uh, not over-controlling is obvious. They're, they're very intentional but subtle with their control movements. Okay. And it, it's m- most of the time much smoother. If something's bumpy with a helicopter, it's, it's probably something with the weather, and it's not them. Um, and with no exception, everybody who's flown a helicopter that has flown with me has stood out. They are better. Interesting. And it's it. nothing. There I said it. <laughs> it's nothing about like the people, you know. Like I'm just a better pilot. No. It's just because I, that's what I learned. And you're yeah. just forced to be way more uh, in tune to like every little movement of every control surface. Yeah. Um, you just it, you're forced to be that way. So like if I transition to a tailwheel tomorrow, I think with even with a, a lot of fixed wing, only fixed wing time, I would pick it up much slower than I think if he got into a tailwheel. You'd have that footwork down instantly, where I would struggle with that, waking my feet up after decades of not having to use them. <laughs> yeah, you're very in tune in a helicopter to the no, you know, where the nose is pointed and how your feet, you know, interact with that. Um, yeah, I think I feel like a tailwheel transition would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, question that I've been meaning to ask you: um, You've transitioned from the flying world to controlling, and then now back to an airlines. Um, was this a difficult shift for you, as far as your mindset from one role to another within your career changes? They were both hard. Okay. Leaving the regional world to become a controller, there was there was no podcast about ATC, so I had a lot of things that I had made up in my head. That took years to figure out. Okay. Um, that was a very hard transition because I had to get out of the airplane. And I had to stop thinking like a pilot. And you have to start thinking logically in terms of solving puzzles. Sure. Not flying the planes. And that took a long time. That yeah. was hard. Um, I, I was certainly current when I went to the airlines, but not airline equipped currency. <laughs> we'll put it that way. <laughs> it's a different type of operation okay it's very fast paced and i was learning a new company an entirely different manufacturer for an airplane and flew i've flown more in the last six months than i flew in the previous 15 years wow so there's a lot going on uh the transition was uh, all that to say it was as hard or maybe more difficult to go back 
now than it was to leave and go to air traffic. So they weren't easy just because I had done it before. There were certain things I remembered and can. Yeah. All right. I got that. A lot of the 121 stuff is pretty easy to get back into. Rhythm, pace, pushback, all the things. Who do we call now? That wasn't hard to get back into, but uh, getting an airplane pushback started, taking off in the proper profile and training my brain to work like that again, that it's been a challenge. I mean, every every trip I do now, I'm learning something. Hey, I didn't realize that, you know? And I think that's going to be like that for several years Yeah. to get my comfort level back to where it was. But I think if you plug me into a scope today, I might not remember all the frequencies, but if I had to go back and someone said there's an apocalypse, you got to work all these airplanes, I know I could do that. It it might not be pretty, but I could do it. <laughs> so you could do it. I took a I took 13 months off and came back, and you feel a little rusty for a little bit, but yeah. They're they're very closely related, but they're each of them have things that are very different. So. Sure. I, I do have to compartmentalize that stuff. And I've been biting my tongue going into some places in the U.S. where things are happening. And I, I don't, not that I dislike what's happening, but I, I know what's going on yeah. in that room. And it's not helpful. Because guess what? The product's going to be the same. I can't fix it from up here. Right. So that's been a challenge, too. And I was wondering about that, too. Like, now going back into the flight deck and knowing, like, what's going on on the ground, like, I suppose you do have to compartmentalize it. Yeah, and, and I tell people I have a background in air traffic. It usually starts a pretty good conversation. Okay. And I'll get questions, like we get on the show, from the other seat. Yeah. Hey, why'd they do that? <laughs> you know, not, it doesn't happen every day, but yeah. they have a some story they've made up in their head on why it's happening. And it might take me a couple sentences to know this is what's happening in the background. Sure. Um, so that part's been good. I think I can add and... I'm not in a position where I'm teaching the captain, but if they have questions, I'm happy to, you know, fill them in on some of those things. And most of them are curious. Yeah. So that's fun. Well, as a side note, if you want to see just how rusty you are up at Kid Venture, they do have a Natka booth up there. And, uh, With the uh, simulator? <laughs> yeah, they were teaching yeah. my kids how to run squeeze plays. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I like it. I think you should go try. Uh, <laughs> and videotape it. Okay. <laughs> For the internet. <laughs> All right, so most people know you guys, of course, for the Opposing Bases podcast. Um, but just in case somebody doesn't know who you are, like my dad listens to our podcast, but probably that's it. So for my dad, what is Opposing Bases, and uh, what made you guys decided to start a podcast? Hi, Dad. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> you want me to start? Go ahead. So we, it, everybody that we worked with um, knew we were pilots, and... Despite what people may think, the controllers don't get a lot of aviation flying training, even on, you know, classroom. They're never in an airplane. They don't have to do an observation flight. It's voluntary. And they spend a little bit of time at the academy initially going over. They kind of condense private and commercial and instrument into, like, four days of classroom. Cookery. Well, obviously, that's <laughs> it's going to go in one ear yeah. and out the other. And they might remember a couple things. So, anyway, we were getting questions at work. Hey, why'd they do this? And we actually did not work on the same crew until a couple years into this. Yeah. We were on different sets of days off. And I, like I hardly saw you. Yeah, we yeah. didn't really, we, we, were, we barely knew each other. I mean, we passed in the hallway. Yeah. It's a 24-hour facility. He was on different days. And um, I had been listening for several months to Airline Pilot Guy podcast. And I thought, man, that's cool. There's, they answer questions. And one day we started talking about it, and we did overlap. Like, hey, we could do this. Like, people could ask questions, and we always joke we thought we could do it in 10 episodes. <laughs> and, and look at you now. <laughs> and it just keeps – and we've repeated some things for sure. Yeah. But each different question and scenario has something new in it. And as long as the questions keep coming, we'll keep answering them. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, we we have a unique perspective. I don't. There's nobody else that has a weekly. Maybe you might run into pilots that are controllers, and the other way around. But they're not doing a show and and, yeah. and setting up an infrastructure to to answer things. So, I mean, we're proud of it. We're proud of yeah, we, sharing it. We felt like we we brought just something different to the table, um, and could answer questions from a pretty unique perspective. Uh, like Ari said, I mean, we have controllers at work who are pilots, 
but they're not airline pilots. They don't have what four thousand, almost five. five. I think at five the end thousand of this year, hours. About five thousand. I've got twenty two hundred hours helicopter time, yeah. airline time, combat you know. missions. Like we're drawing on a lot of good actual experience that we can talk about instead of it being a hypothetical. Sure. Yeah. And I say this about air traffic. Uh, uh, Despite its level, um, Triad's a 7 out of the 4 through 12 ranking. Tracons and controllers that work in towers and Tracons, they have a unique set of skills. They can do up and down. And you can, you can get really busy in those environments. And it's really challenging. So when you check in with a Charlie controller and you think, oh, it's a small Charlie in the middle, you know, Milwaukee, they're busy. They have sure. a lot going on. You yeah, know? and if they're not always busy, they can be. Yes. And and you have to be able to work that, you know, 20, 30 minute, maybe it's an hour long push of just insanity. Uh, and if you can't, you're not going to get checked out. They're very difficult facilities, especially in radar, to get yes. to get through. Um, yep. So that, you know, helped us bring a lot of different uh, a huge aspect of the air traffic side into the show was there's radar, there's tower, there's, you know, work in final, there's, it, it's just kind of a, a grab bag of everything. We're doing military, we're yeah. doing cargo and commercial, everything. So, And a lot of our questions give us an opportunity to kind of step back. Okay, we heard the very specific question. Some, some feedback is more succinct. But we can usually pull back and say, hey, let's let's pull that back into our airspace and our experience. If we were in that sure. plane or at the scope when that happened, it doesn't have to be only related to the specifics of that question. And, you know, if your listeners have never heard our show, it's it's anonymous in the fact that you can ask a question and not worry about someone saying that was you <laughs> and hearing, <laughs> hearing from the FAA. You know, yeah. we're not doing anything wrong. By answering your question, it doesn't matter where it is. It's the experience that people want to hear about. And I think those stories are helping other people. Hey, that wasn't just me. That happened to, you know, that sounds like something that I ran into. That, I think, is how the show keeps going. Yeah. So with that, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, you expected to answer all these questions in 10 episodes. I got to imagine you didn't imagine the success that you guys would have in the podcasting space with an aviation so I guess with that um, is my question, if I can find where I just lost myself in my notes. Um, <laughs> I've never had that happen. <laughs> never, ever, huh? <laughs> Whose turn is it? It's my turn? What? <laughs> <laughs> so what propelled you to eventually uh, become one of the top-rated aviation podcasts that's out there? <laughs> or did it just kind of happen? <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> it just happened. We just kept doing the show. Yeah. Just keep doing it. Do it every week. Just put a show out. We figured out a way to do it. Sometimes we recorded two in a day so that we could go on vacation. And, you know, we sometimes I feel like we work our lives around the show when we need to and the show around our lives when we need to. But we always just found a way to keep going, to yeah. keep doing a show even when you didn't feel like it. Like doing a show when you're sick. Yep you don't feel good like i just the last thing i want to do is go sit in front of a camera and yeah. you know and a microphone and record the show but we just kept doing it and i think that was what you just keep plugging away and plugging away and plugging away and um, our listeners have a lot to do with spreading the word i mean there's yeah. podcasts are not unknown but they're you know, you step a couple steps outside of aviation, you may not find anybody that even heard them. You know, they they listen to music or they listen to the radio. Yeah. But I've never met anybody that started listening to podcasts and said, well, this is terrible, being able to choose whatever I want to hear about at any given point right. and listen for essentially for free to any topic. You can find it. Um, so we have a niche. We have a, a, a listener base that's very strong. They're spreading the word. They're saying, hey, have you ever heard this podcast? The first question you get back is probably, what's a podcast? Okay, let me walk you through that. Let's get over that hurdle. Yeah, yeah. And then they, you know, you've introduced somebody to a different world of things they can hear instead of, you know, the talking heads on TV or, you know, whatever. Um, spreading the word. It's organic. We didn't, there was no button to check like, hey, we want to be at the top of these charts that they don't tell you how to get there. You just right. keep focusing on the content, consistency, 
And I think the, the missing, the variable for us that I think we're really good at is we are really engaged with our audience. It doesn't exist if we don't get feedback. Right, right. And that's lacking in some shows that might fade off. You know, there's, if there's no feedback, the hosts give up. Well, hey, if no one's given us any idea of how this is going, what are we doing this for? Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, and I think the, the feedback part of it has been key for us because it really helps us stick on to stuff that matters to everybody because it's their sure, questions, their questions, right? It's yeah. their content. Right. And we just are like a, a platform, a medium for mm-hmm. for passing that. That's a great point. That stuff, you know, back and forth. Yeah, to your point about engagement too, I mean, how many podcasts are out there that make it to six episodes and just stop? Right. Because they're, they're not getting the instant gratification i think that yeah. sometimes our society craves and they just give up or they burn themselves out so fast and i, and I think for the average consumer if this is something i can educate and just kind of i'm not complaining about it but there's there's a lot of work that goes on bef- before you hit record yep. and after that people may not recognize like hey you guys are not paid to do this this isn't an employment relationship right. you're, you're getting up and and Figuring out how to make this work. We're all figuring out audio. I'm not an audio engineer. Yeah. I don't know anything about this stuff, this equipment, all these buttons, fancy microphones. Like, all that's new. You know, so if you're plugging in and you're listening to content that you really like, just think about what goes in to make that happen. There's there's so much you don't appreciate. And, you know, it's just take a minute to recognize that it, that the hosts don't have to keep doing it. Right, right. You know, and it's, it is, you do have to kind of run your life around the schedule. Yeah. And and think about how you're going to navigate and how to keep your putting out episodes. But if you stop putting out the episodes, you lose those listeners and you never get them back. Right. So, so on the equipment, your audio can't be total garbage. Right. But <laughs> right. <laughs> because then I don't care what you're saying. People just don't want yeah. to. You know, if it sounds terrible, they just don't want to hear it. But what you're saying is so much more important than how it's you know the quality of what it's is being said so i you know i've had i have like 1400 hobbies and i've gotten into (laughs) like a ton of you know things and i see how easy it could be to get wrapped up in the equipment and oh let's do this and that and let's upgrade this and we could do these microphones and these special cables don't get if you're trying to get into podcasting and this isn't directed at you guys. I'm just saying, you know, in general, for the yeah. for people that might be interested in it, don't get wrapped up in, do I have the best mic? Do, yeah. Just make content that people want to hear. And that is really the, the key to, you know, getting the ball rolling. And I think we've even evolved in that space with our podcast. So like last year at Air Venture, we had these little wireless lapel mics that were kind of garbage. And mm-hmm. we still put out, what, three, four episodes at least of just air venture content so we've upped our game a little bit this year but um yeah last year was just a handheld digital recorder and some wireless appell mics and away you go right so you you came out you brought your stuff you did a thing and you saw okay i think we were limited by this piece of equipment or yep, that yep. so now let's go in but and i you see guys that get into in anything really they want to get all the stuff before they even know what they're yeah, doing. Right. And go out there, go make a show, you know, record something, listen to it. Hey, what does what sounds good? What sounds bad? Why did this sound bad? You know, and sort of figure it out. We just kind of figured it yeah. out as we went. And our audio quality and the way we record it has changed over the years, but the content's still there. And we don't get feedback saying, I think in 340 episodes, we've gotten maybe three or four or like, hey, I noticed this is happening. I'm an audio guy. And they've been really constructive where we yeah, can take good. it and go, yeah. okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that. Because, yeah, be willing to take but that. But no complaining. It's not like I can't sure. listen to your garbage. It sounds terrible. So I will say this. I know you guys aren't going to walk me down a question to, to perk <laughs> up your show, but you, you guys do a great job. I love the way you guys do your show. Your audio does sound really good. Oh, thank you so much. And, and you guys have a good um, interplay, which I know is – with two of us seeing each other we do it we can see each other which helps i don't know if you guys are it sounds like you're together it sounds like you're around a table and even if you're not it's what it sounds like because you guys know each other and you're pausing at the right times yeah it's not difficult to get through 
a show. So good job on that end. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you. But and realistically, like Air Venture is about the only time that we're all sitting around like in a group like we are right, right. now. It's all remote. Like Maddie's in Kansas, Andrew's in right. Wisconsin. I'm in Minnesota. So <laughs> it's a little plug for that too. Having a distance uh, recording happening. The logistics behind that, there's no manual online for that. There's, <laughs> If you Google that, you are going to spend days trying to yeah. figure that out. Yes. So good job figuring that out. That piece of equipment is helpful if you ever yeah. explore it. But you got to take the time to learn this new piece of software and yep. this new thing. So good on you guys for doing it. I thought you were together. People have approached us and said, wait, you guys aren't in the same place? No, <laughs> we're not. And it's, But thank you for thinking that because... That's the goal. We sync up our. Yeah. It sounds like we're having a conversation. So I mean, it's similarly with us. We want it to. We want it to feel like we're just sitting around a hangar and yes. you know, shooting it the does. breeze. It and does. That's, that's the vibe we're that's going. That's what your sounds so. like. So so we appreciate that that feedback. That's really helpful. That's some very helpful, timely feedback. If you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do the r- robot voice for timely feedback. However, <laughs> that's their thing. I don't want to yep. steal that. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned your families don't listen to your podcast. My wife does, actually. Okay. My son would never listen, but my wife does. <laughs> she listens enough. to every episode, and she's provided me with good, you know, I don't I don't remember what episode it was. I probably should have written it down. It was probably the best advice I ever got. When we started the show, I was far more serious and not scared, but I always felt like we were a step away from crossing this in, invisible, non-existent line that we've stayed on the correct side of, um, doing the right thing trying not to disparage anybody and she finally said you got to loosen up like have more fun like you sound like you're stressing out sometimes so shout out to my wife for telling me to relax i think it's helped our interplay on the on the audio because you've always been better at that of joking around and Mm -hmm. having more fun so (laughs) well even today who's in charge bit was right i was entertained (laughs) So then, do you guys listen to your own podcast? Uh, I well, <laughs> mostly no, <laughs> mostly no. He will say, "Hey, go to go back to two seventy five, minute eighteen, and listen for a couple minutes." Yeah. I'll go back. Oh yeah, okay, I, I remember that. So the, uh, I do the post, and that's okay. really what kind of it forces me to listen to some of it. Um, I don't know what you do in terms of your edit, but I don't spend a ton of time going back and having regrets. It, it's coming. We don't do a lot of cut and pasting. It's gone. I'm, it's going out. And that's because of the way the show fits into our lives. Sure. I have I have two hours after this is done, not two weeks. So I'm getting it done or it's not coming out. And sometimes that process will involve me. I'll get, I'll get honed in on something. I get distracted. And then on the way to work, I... We usually, I, we usually started on Monday. We recorded that morning. I'd be on my way to work, and I'd l- make sure that it populates all the things that happen in the behind the scenes that you forget what you did years ago. Yeah. And it's just a check. And then I'll end up playing it. And, you know, how does it sound in my car? Does it sound like we're I, – I, I try to make the audio something that people aren't, like, struggling with, up, down, up, down. And with multiple voices and audio, that's we sound different. Um, but So I probably listen to it because of that more, not because I – what did we say then? It's it's in the past. It's gone, but from a technical editing perspective, I do listen. And I'd say that we're pretty similar. Like I'll when I do the actual edit, I'll listen to it at like one and a half speed so I can get through it a little bit quicker. Yeah. I've made some notes and know what I want to cut or remove mm-hmm. based on what each guest has said. Like, ooh, I didn't like what I said there. Can we take that out? So I've I've got my notes ready to go. But then I too will listen to it in its entirety, like in my car. Yeah. Because it's just a different. Different than having it like in my head, oh, yeah. like right on my ears. So, yeah, and yeah. I'll, I'll fully admit I listen to our own podcast because I'm so engrossed in the show notes and trying to think of the right yeah. way to ask a question that, unfortunately, I I often miss a lot of the interview. Yep. And it's nice to go back just from the fan perspective and hear the edit that Jim does mm. and just enjoy it. That happened to me during the show today. I was trying to make sure we're we're sending YouTube audio okay. out and. We did a first time setup the way we were doing the actual recording, and it, my pr- production brain is freaking out because I can't fix this later. If I'm getting a bad feed, we only had one track. It was coming off of their mixer, right. which for you guys, yeah. that would give you uh, like 
kind of panic attacks. I've been thinking that for like <laughs> weeks. Like, I, if this isn't right, that I don't have a recording. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at that, and I missed some of the things that were happening. So I will listen to this later on, and hey, I don't, I don't even remember that happening because I was looking at right. some dial right. that's really important for the recording quality, but nobody cares except for me. Right. So. You know what? I care. <laughs> Good job today. <laughs> Thank you. With the setup, <laughs> the technical you. side of that. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Well, from the audience perspective, it was pretty flawless. I mean, I didn't notice any hiccups from our end or any that like you were totally engaged. So. AOPA yeah, gave us an cool. awesome solution. They did a really good job of okay. making he, he We had a little bit of an exchange. The tech guy realized I was a little bit OCD <laughs> and, and threw a solution out there. And I was okay. like, wait a second. Your way is a lot easier, provided we don't mess up these two critical steps, which we spent some time on the show before us. I okay. tested it. I sent him out to YouTube between you know four or five of us. Yeah, hey, yeah. is this audio going out? Because this is what I'm about to duplicate on the stage. So, yeah, I didn't dream up that scenario. They just kind of walked us down that. <laughs> oh, I had a follow-up to that that popped in my head and then went away. That's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess to Andrew's point, too, um, yeah, like we're so wanting to make sure that, like, we're the questions are flowing well. Or as you say something, all right, I've got to add this question in here that yeah there are moments that you get distracted in the interview so to again listen through as a fan of like say for you guys for example like listen through as a fan of your podcast and hear how this interview went um i like doing that too so i listen to it two or three times between edits and and afterwards something i don't know if it's happened to you guys yet but when it does it's i i enjoy it from a host a host perspective i've seen several times and i know he's seen it to me as well where our mind has changed on the way we read a question by watching the other person for a second and, and <laughs> avoiding the urge to speak up when there's a little bit of silence. Just wait. Let the other person kind of develop this thought. And I I know I've said some things that were, were incorrect in the way I was thinking about it. And I, once I've heard from you, it's like, wait a second. Hold on. Now you've changed my mind on this. I didn't think about it that way. And you can only do that if you trust your notes and you take the time to actually, you have to listen. You have to pull yourself yeah. out of the, the tech side. And I, you're looking at the next question. You, you kind of, It's hard. You have to say, I'm going to be in this conversation now because it's going to be better if yeah. I'm actually listening to everything that the other person is saying. Because it might change the way you think about it. That's all to say it. Yeah. It can change your mind real time. And that is, I love that. I love when that happens. Yeah, the, the interview sort of format is a really tough format for the person giving the interview. For, like, on our end of it now, I'm just answering your questions. But yeah. for you to, like, try to keep up with this conversation, stay ahead of the conversation, and it is. I, and I'm not good at that. That, like, the interview format, I'm terrible that so I think that's another part of we just I don't know how we ended up in the format that we do but I think you know it plays to our weaknesses and at least mine and I our, think you're you're really good at you know we may read a 250 300 word paragraph of somebody's feedback and it might be the first time you've seen it who when I I stopped doing the notes in almost a year now and you've been doing them so one of us might be seeing that feedback for the first time sure so you got to give him time to comprehend it. It takes me much longer. He'll have a, a full synopsis in his head. All right, let me ask you this. And I'm like, how did you do that? How did you shrink that up into like this bite-sized, yeah. you know, package that we can all understand really quickly? Um, but you have to. It's hard to listen on a show where you're responsible for making volume, right? Yeah. yeah. And you have to do that. Yeah, I'm not good at listening and then, like, trying to think, you know, or look at... the. Ne if I start looking at the next mm -hmm. question... Uh, nope, gone. I just totally... <laughs> yeah. I'm totally checked out. I've you asked know. him, hey, read ahead. I know you're going to need time on this. <laughs> and I, I, I shouldn't even say it because you, you can't. You're going to stay here. Yep. And I'm going to be surprised in a minute, and I just have to accept it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said to you the other night, like, stop reading ahead. Yeah, it's just like back in grade school, like yep. get back the class is back here. <laughs> yeah, I got called out for sure. <laughs> and I left it in. Yep. <laughs>
What's up aviation friends? Are you looking to upgrade your wardrobe? Well, check out Pilot Quarters, your new favorite flying shirt from a family owned company right in the Midwest in Michigan. Whether you're in the cockpit or just out and about, Pilot Quarters has you covered with comfortable camp shirts, stylish polos, and breezy sundresses. All with breathtaking and chart inspired designs. They have unique designs by state, region, or if you contact the guys, you can make a special request. So visit Pilot Quarters today at pilotquarters.com and soar in style. Are you tired of cheap, uncomfortable sunglasses that don't fit under your headset? Well, it's time for you to check out Flying Eyes. Flying Eyes sunglasses are specifically designed by pilots for pilots, offering unmatched comfort and clarity. With their lightweight frames and durable design, you'll forget you're even wearing them. Here's the best part. You can save 10% on your next purchase by using our code FLYMIDWEST10 at checkout. I've had mine now for over a year and I wouldn't dream of flying with anything else. So check them out at flyingeyesoptics.com today. Hey there, Flying Midwest fans. We've got some exciting news for you as we've launched some brand new merch at flyingmidwest.com. Check out the all new Flying Midwest media design that has a chart plate design on the back that features tons of fun references to both Flying Midwest podcast and Fly the Transition. But that's not all. We're also thrilled to introduce Badger Gear, featuring our pal, the Badger Pilot's distinct logo. So go ahead and check out both those designs and much more at flyingwithwest.com forward slash merch. All right, so in about six years of podcasting and you're approaching 350 episodes, you still get new questions from time to time as feedback. Is there any question that you wish somebody would ask you just so you could have the opportunity to answer that and get the word out about something? That's an interesting question. Mm. That is a that is a That's tough. That's a really good question. I wish I had seen that beforehand. I could prepare a really good answer. <laughs> um, I think what I you know this is one of many thoughts I've had over the years, but and I, and I we've both been on both sides of this. I think it's um, I I wish there was more outreach and immersion and education for the controllers to understand what's happening in that Cherokee, what that, what's happening in the Cirrus, sure. what's happening in the, you know, the 737 on final that's trying to get the airplane configured. Um, I wish someone would say, what do you, when and they have, we've gotten it in various different ways. What do you wish controllers knew? I can say this for being in an airplane recently. I wish they knew, even if it's just one of your 5, 10, 15 airplanes you're talking to, they are, in a Tracon world, that pilot is very busy. And I wish there was a little more appreciation of that before, you know, you didn't get an immediate response and yeah. you get frustrated or they didn't comply immediately and you're freaking out. It, build that in. It, there's a lot going on. And, and the further down you go on the experience, it's infinitely harder for someone who's out there on a private lesson or an instrument training. Just it, maybe be a little more tolerant and empathetic of what's going on in the airplane. And yes, you have a hard job as a controller, but I wish more controllers listened to our show. I, I think our audience is probably 95% pilots yeah. or non-pilots that aren't controllers either. And maybe five, that's probably high. Yeah, that's high. Probably 1% or less are controllers. And they're the ones who would benefit as much as the pilots have over the years, I think. Absolutely. I, and as soon as you started talking about that, that was exactly what I thought. I wish controllers or as curious about pilots' duties and jobs as pilots are about controllers. Sure. Now, granted, there's way more pilots than controllers, but we get very little from controllers saying, why is this happening? Why is that happening? And that's all we get from the pilot side is trying to understand, you know, the controller's mindset um so yeah i wish controllers were a little bit more curious um about what what constraints pilots are under when they're busy when they're not when's a good time you know just all of that stuff they i wish they were a little bit more engaged in that did you add a question while i put my phone down so I was going to say that's basically our last question as well, oh, okay. but we could open it up as well. No, I, I saw you. 
I thought I saw you adding a question. I did, and then I deleted it. I was, I was trying to be more in, into the conversation, <laughs> and I put my phone down and turned it off so I could be engaged with our guests, <laughs> based on some very recent feedback that yes. we received. <laughs> well, every interview we have, we ask our guests the same question, and you kind of touched on it, but we'll open it up to anything, and uh, I'll hand it over to Jim. Well, thanks. Um, this is the part of the show where we like to ask our guests an unpopular aviation opinion. That could be your hot take on something in aviation. It could be controlling. It could be flying. It could be anything. Um, do you guys have any hot takes or opinions you'd want to share that are not the views of Penguin Airlines or, or the, the agency? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not unpopular. It's it's not something that I'm supposed to say as a controller, but the NOTAM system, the PIREP, that is just a complete nightmare. Um, I cannot stand PIREPs for the most part because all that we're doing is checking a box. Okay, I got the one I needed for the hour because the ceilings are less than 5,000 and the visibility is less than five miles, you know. And so we're just gotta have a PIREP, bases and tops, bases and tops. And it is sometimes to the detriment of what actually is important we lose sight of that in having this sheet that we're just checking off there on the 11 hour yep did the pirate 12 hour did the pirate um and so it it drives me absolutely nuts the other thing and this is i go on the rant about this on the show all the time is bird advisories like you kidding me birds they live next to the earth oh (laughs) wow okay thank you you know and so what Whenever there's a bird strike, the first question they ask was, were bird advisories on the ATIS? And I'm like, would that have done anything? Would it have (laughs) prevented, you know, the bird strike? No. So that kind of stuff about the government drives me absolutely nuts. And when you live in it every day, day in and day out, it just starts to feel like insanity. What are we doing all this for? There's stuff that's so much more important that matters to pilots that information we should be gathering and passing on and i'm talking notums and pyreps and birds and everything else right. that we just skip over for the check the box you know kind of a thing so that's my little well i think that andrew appreciates bird reports because having <laughs> hit two of them now yeah. he's working on becoming a bird strike ace well. where start putting little birds <laughs> on his plane for each birdie strikes oh i like it well like in, it. in one of those there was no atis or awas to Give me a bird advisory. So. Yeah, right. only there was. Yeah. You probably would have aimed for it to become yeah. an ace. <laughs> I, I have an unpopular opinion, I think. We would love to and, hear it, And sir. we're in a, a crowd of a lot of pilots that may disagree with this. I think above 2,000 feet, it should be mandatory to talk to air traffic everywhere. We've never met another controller that doesn't want to talk to that target. And we can help that by removing the constraints that are put on them. It's as simple as wanting to be able to reach out and give you a traffic advisory, ask yeah. you where you're going. I, there's a lot of planes that may not be capable of that. That aside, why aren't we having every pilot talk to air traffic all the time? I, I think it should be mandatory to get flight following above 2,000 feet. That's unpopular. I've never said that on the show. But it would lead, if, if, the, if the end game of all this are we are, are we helping the aviation community? I think we are. Why? Because I think some people feel like they're contributing and they're more safe in the environment. And and if we're removing this, the fear of talking to air traffic, you become part of a network of other pilots that are talking. There's somebody at the scope has the big picture. Yeah. That's the person that's probably going to be there when you need them. So why aren't we making it where everybody has to talk to them? I don't know. Is that too crazy of an opinion? Yes. Okay. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No. Uh, yeah, I agree. For the most part, are there times where you need to go out and just do your thing on your own and not talk to anybody? Sure. Sure. But if you're going like A to B and traveling somewhere and you're not down low level scud running or whatever, yeah, I agree. You need to be talking to somebody. We want to talk to you. I. You know, we get guys skim over the top of the Charlie all the time, which they're allowed to do, but it's just just a terrible place to be. Terrible. Um, And pilots that listen to us know that now. So 
I mean, it should be mandatory to listen to our show, but we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, if there's a way to make like, that yeah. happen. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I think to your point, like, when I go to, like, our practice area is right under a shelf of, what is it, Tiny Fruit Bravo? Is that what we call it, where I'm at? Uh, sure. Minneapolis? No. Oh. What's Oh. Oh, yes. What's the Tiny Fruit? <laughs> I thought Tiny Fruit was a mini apple. I thought Tiny Fruit was in the Bay Area, like Napa. Grapes. That's, yeah, grapes. That's what I always thought. <laughs> Mini, Mini apples? Apple. I thought yeah. that's... Okay. okay. At any rate, um, under, <laughs> under my Bravo, like our practice area is like run under a shelf of that. So I'm I'm not always talking with ATC, but I at least have approach control for that area plugged in. So if they say that, you know, they call out traffic and I go, wait, that's me, I can key up real quick. There, there's a solution out there that we talked about recently on the show that that is... They, they, I think they got it from procedures in Europe. What, passive or uh, inactive flight? Uh, what do they call it? Passive flight following? I think it's passive flight following. Yeah. I've heard if, of that. If that takes off, that could change a lot in how pilots interact with ATC. Because, look, here's the elephant in the room. A lot of Bravo controllers don't have time to talk to everybody that's jammed down beneath the Bravos yeah. that they didn't design. They're busy doing other things. But... It would be awesome for them. And I bet you if you surveyed them, hey, would it be nice if you could just reach out and talk to them? You know they're listening because they have this special squat code in. Yeah, that would be really cool. I don't have time to give them all the fun stuff, traffic advisors, but if I needed to in a pinch, I know they're listening. That would be great. Yeah. It's a win-win. The pilot has somebody that's kind of watching them, and they're available to be spoken to. Yeah. And the controller has the ability to move or... Hey, what are you doing? I you're in a terrible spot. Please move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone's someone in the legal department at the FAA's head just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, we're giving this guy service, but we're not giving him service. And when it's do we turn done. it on? It's and when do we done. turn it off? I know it's yeah. being done. I just think that it's like giving those people twitches. Yeah. You know. No, you're you're right. Which is I don't care. That's fine. There's a, there's a legal arm to all this, right? Protection and and figuring out who's responsible for certain things. I, I appreciate that. I get it. But that doesn't mean that it's black or white. There's a, there's a solution in there that that can, can happen, I think. Yeah. All right. Um, before we close out, I just want to give a huge shout-out to your live show director. He has been running his tail off today. He's Jeff, awesome. You've done amazing work today um, for the Opposing Bases guys. Um, you did amazing work for them on our podcast uh, before air venture by showing up as a live show director and wearing all their merch in a visual uh, i'm sorry in an audio only podcast that no one <laughs> but us can see so uh way to represent their brand on our podcast um but no in all seriousness it's been great having you out here with us too um, um so i just wanted to give you a quick shout out anything you want to say uh thanks for the shout out it's been great it's been really fun hanging out with you guys these past few days and uh, i just want to thank you for the invitation to have opposing bases on your podcast. I think it'll be really great, and I'm actually looking forward to going back and listening to this. Thank you. Um, and to you two gentlemen, again, we can't thank you enough for being part of the uh, podcast this afternoon and taking time out of your busy schedule at AirVenture to uh, chat all things podcasting and aviation. So thank you again so much. Thanks for having, Thanks us. For having us. Thanks, guys. The end. Flight Chef 536, contact Minneapolis Center 132.35 today. Thanks so much for joining us on the Flying Midwest Podcast. Until next time, podcast service terminated, Squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Good day.